Um, thanks for doing this. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. I've I've read a bunch of the stuff from your website. Um, you know, obviously a very relevant uh, story over the last given you know given the last two or three years. And of course, I don't know if you've ever heard you know my stuff, but I'm highly critical of what we've you know we're, I think we're all calling fiat medicine. But even before that came into the lexicon, just the way in which um, so-called Western medicine or allopathic medicine was practiced and the influence of pharma and the false, you know, the shitty incentives in the system and all that. And so when I saw you pop up on my Twitter feed and looked into kind of the things you were saying, I was very intrigued and wanted to talk to you. So here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This will be, I think this is actually the first time I'm doing like a video recorded discussion. So first for me but uh yeah i have listened to your podcast and a couple of your colleagues in the bitcoin space and it's kind of how i got started i guess how i found the motivation and uh incentive to get started you mean to start sharing your thoughts and writing about this stuff and calling yourself rem remnant nd md and yeah. that kind of stuff yeah yeah well that and also more broadly you know being kind of in the thick of it during the Let's call it COVID era, for lack of a better term, over the last few years. Um, seeing the things that I've seen and learning the things that I've learned, it became quite difficult at some point to find the motivation to continue on a path that seemed like it wasn't really leading anywhere that was of substance and of, uh, uh, how should we say, fulfillment and... Uh, spiritual balance for lack of a better term um mm. but finding the bitcoin community or i should say the bitcoin maximalist community and kind of how they help me reframe my perspective on the present and future and figure out a way of life that was more sustainable um that really gave me the motivation to start writing and communicating and doing all the things I've done with uh, Remnant MD because my wife has been telling me to write and publish what I've been <laughs> telling her at home, right. coming home from work, uh, drained from some of the experiences for many years. And I guess to some extent, she was just getting tired of being the only ear to hear what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly how this podcast got started. My now <laughs> wife, you know, I was, it was 2019, by the way, do you want to just fire this up live? Um, yeah, Again, yeah, your, your your face will be showing. And um, so I just wanted to double confirm you're okay with that. And yeah. you can say whatever you want. Don't censor yourself. You know, it's all good. So okay. fire it up. There we go. We're live. Um, cool. But yeah, you know, my case was the same. It, I think it was 2019 and I was living in Thailand uh, with my now wife. And, you know, I had been into Bitcoin for a while. But as you know, like the further you go down the rabbit hole, it really becomes even more intriguing and kind of all all consuming. And, uh, every day I would just be like corner her and be like, do you realize, you know, that sort of thing. And she was <laughs> like, look, you gotta, you gotta find another outlet. And so I was like, all right, well, maybe I should talk to some other people that are seeing things the same way. Um, but anyways, man, maybe, um, maybe a great place to start is just kind of a bit about your background. And again, you know, for the people that are just tuning into the live stream, how you came to, uh, start doing what you're doing now, you know, the label remnant M MD, the writing you're doing, you're incredibly prolific. I mean, you seem to have a very consistent, um, you know, writing routine. Now your, your website is filled with a bunch of blog posts. And a lot of them are, of course, being seen through the lens of being critical of the traditional allopathic so-called Western medicine system. And I think that resonates with a lot of us because, you know, once you take the orange pill, you begin to see just how insidious those false fiat incentives are in so many areas of society if not all of them and that's why everything basically needs to be recapitulated and recon reconsidered you know we did a uh, myself and rob and uh, eric and hoddle did a, a podcast with uh, sailor in miami recently and you know he, we all knew that already but it was it was interesting to see him make that point i think it was near the end where he said look like once you really grok bitcoin you need to reconsider everything. It changes how you see absolutely everything yeah. because the you know money and the incentives around money are at the you know at the base layer of all action institutions and how everything evolves and develops on top of them. And it's so true. And you know, long-winded way of saying a lot of us have come to um, 
have, you know, revisit lifestyle and health and medicine and fitness and all of those things. And that's, you know, possibly even one of the, the primary reconsiderations that I've noticed in the Bitcoin community. I mean, it's happening everywhere, but certainly on the level of diet and health, that's been a very popular one. You know, the whole carnivore steak issue, but also just getting rid of or or, or dialing down at least, you know, refined foods and having a distrust mm -hmm. of, you know, pharmaceuticals and, and the traditional medical system. And so I think it's great that there's someone like you that's noticed that and who, who for whom I, I presume that's happened to you as well. And then you've combined that with your traditional training and hopefully are able to synthesize a way of looking at health and medicine that is more in tune with the principles found in Bitcoin and more, more cognizant and recognizes the degree to which that insidious force of, of fiat has corrupted medicine and, you know, hopefully for the benefit of us all. So why don't you uh, take it away with a little intro? Yeah. Um, so I guess what's relevant in terms of my background goes back to where I'm from. I'm from an ex-Soviet country. So the echoes of uh, certain economic policies, incentives, um, rules around uh, speech, like when I go back to my home country still, like you can't publicly, you know, how should I say, insult or speak negatively about the powers in government because it is a well-known fact that people who do that, especially if they do it loud enough, you know, some people pull up, they get taken into a van and things get a little bit uh, unfortunate for you and your family. Um, so that is the background that I come from. And I think that kind of uh, had an influence on my, how should I say it, my threshold for skepticism, for seeing things with a bit of a, when I was young, it was more cynical. Now it's just more critical, you know, like it's, mm how do you know the things that you seem so certain of um where do you get the uh foundation to make claims so boldly and so strongly so that i think really uh i think that was critical in my ability to recognize the downsides and the pitfalls and then uh kind of just move past that with a lot of my colleagues you know they're stuck in the hole they would never lie to us you know, why would anyone do this? Mm. Where would anyone have the motivation to act so, uh, what's the word, sinisterly in not just in day-to-day -day life, but at the level of institutions, whether they're academic, hospitals, governmental, regulator. Like, this is one of the things I found with my colleagues uh, over the years, um, most of which I spent on the East Coast Um like the Northeast of uh, the U S was they just, they couldn't get past the step of why would anyone do that? <laughs> what, what would drive them to do things that would have such a negative impact on people's lives? Um, so you have that as one element of uh, what, what makes me, me. And then the other element is just curiosity. I think that's partly why I got into medicine is because I found the body to be so fascinating and specifically the brain you know my in my undergrad i'm canadian so i did my undergraduate in canada um and then i did my medical training in the u.s and i've been studying the brain the nervous system and psychology for i want to say since i was 19 so it's been almost 12 13 years so that's what really got me into medicine was a curiosity for how such a insanely elaborate and complex system operates um and then eventually the medical route took me to where i am now where the moment i started medical school i started seeing things in ways you know i should take a step back and say when you're trying to get into medical school you're trying to paint like a picture of yourself and your perception about medicine and why you're going into it you know oh i want to help people and this that and the other thing but the moment i got into medical school and i've written a bit about this in the first few posts people started having different conversations you know conversations about uh where the most money lies in medicine what specialties to go into that would uh allow you to live a life that is quite luxurious and i soon found out that that was actually related to something else in that most people who are in medicine 
have family who were in medicine. So they were already used to a certain lifestyle Mm. that maybe added another layer of incentive or motivation for them to make the types of decisions they were making. Um, So that's where it started to, I started to get more, more cynical, more skeptical of what I saw, because I started to see from the very beginning, like these, these students haven't even started learning anatomy and they're already talking about where they're going to be making the most money. And that to me was strange because like where I come from and the reason why my parents wanted me to go into medicine is that they view the doctor, the physician as a, they, they have an elevated perception of what the physician is. And historically, this has also been the case, you know, I, I've, I've written about uh, the Hippocratic Oath and how that's the, the tenets of the oath have kind of been lost in modern education and practice. But if you read it, you realize that, that, that there's almost like a spiritual calling to the physician and there are moral, uh, um, there is a moral burden that they carry that that supersedes almost everything else. That's why there's such a thing as patient doctor confidentiality. And in modern times, unless it would imply an immediate and direct threat to someone else's livelihood, you are to maintain that confidentiality at all costs. Um, to me, that suggests that there is a spiritual weight and responsibility that's on the physician that is merely, uh, that's more than merely someone who you go to see and they make things better for you. There's a lot more to it than that. And my family viewed it, still views it from that perspective, despite all that they've learned through me. <laughs> they've maintained their uh, respect for the profession, as have I. Um, <clears throat> So I quickly started to realize that uh, medicine as it's practiced was not what I thought it was. And that allowed me to be very critical as the years progressed after I had started my education and training. And then that led me to the COVID era. Before that, I was still keen on maintaining a trajectory that was academic, uh, that was you know, essentially a second marriage, you know, <laughs> I was going to go into a specialty that uh, I told my wife, you know, like, I won't be around a lot. So, you know, we can't expect that just because I'll be done my education and training that um, I will have more free time because what I wanted to do was all consuming for lack of a better term. Um, you know, like, we're talking minimum of like 70 to 90 hour weeks. Are, are even you after saying what that was? Yeah, I was going to go into a field that's, uh, it's called interventional neuroradiology, which is essentially <clears throat> like minimally invasive neurosurgery. You know, when people get strokes, when they have aneurysms that bleed, they have really bad traumas, they have weird malformations in the brain and the spine that need to be treated uh, minimally invasively, usually through arteries and veins. Um, that's what I was going to do. And I was very much on path to do that. But <laughs> but after what had happened in the COVID era, I had to heavily reconsider what I was going to do. And that wasn't an easy decision. Um, but thankfully, thank God, the birth of our first child made that much easier because there was no way that I was going to spend that much time in a system that, well, you know, that is a system that does what it does both right. to the population and then ultimately to the people that keep it alive, which are the nurses, the techs, you know, you have all the mid-level providers in the hospitals, you have the doctors, you have the professors, the students. When it treats people like the way it did in 2021 and 2022, like there's no way, like it was an easy decision. Like there's no way I'm going to commit this much of my life to this. So that's why I'm here now with, with the remnant MD thing is because I'm trying to figure out a way that uh, to structure my life and my job um, with the thing that I still love to learn about, you know, one of the great things about realizing how inadequate modern medicine is, is that I, the door has opened so much to the things that I want to learn more of, whether they're old, these are like ancient medical texts or modern you know, research, modern ways of looking at health um, that I probably otherwise wouldn't have had the time or the impetus to learn. So yeah, that's what brought me here. And before we get into some of the COVID era experiences, when did 
how did all of this coincide with your, you know, your rabbit hole journey, as it were, just just because I'd like to know how much that kind of amplified what was already a skeptical or thoughtful perspective that you had had, you know, throughout your, your upbringing. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd known about Bitcoin for quite a long time, um, but I wasn't, you know, as you first start to learn about it, you're not really appreciative of the depth of its impact and the profound nature of the implications of this protocol. Um, and then as things were getting very, very grim, you know, and I was starting to get very pessimistic about the future, I started encountering people like yourself, people like, you know, like Safe and his work uh, uh, on the Bitcoin standard, like Michael Saylor and some of the other podcasters in the space. And I realized that the problem that I had wasn't just in my field, it was everywhere. So if that's the case, then I can't really just feel um, gloomy about my specific position in life. I have to realize that this is a pervasive problem and that if there is a solution, then maybe it's worth pursuing that broadly, not just. And like you said, you know, when people take the Oregon pill, it seems to have an impact on almost every aspect of their life, of their thinking. Um, and it, 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 in my case, it was no different. Uh, so what I was trying to figure out once I had appreciated the profundity of Bitcoin is how does this how does this fit into my life and my profession? And I'm honestly, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> sure, sure. It's not a, it's a work in progress and I'm trying As to learn from others. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to learn from you guys and everyone else in this space. Like, you know, Jack Cruz, he's a pretty avid Bitcoiner um, and I'm a huge fan of his work. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out how this fits into a future where I can do what I love and also feel I don't know, like just the ability to sleep at night comfortably and to look my family in the face and say, hey, I did something today that was good for people and didn't just propagate a system that harms people and then profits off the repair. 100%. Well, uh, you know, as I often discuss, um, I think there's going to be more and more demand, particularly amongst people that share that same perspective for all manner of, of products and services. You know, that's why like you want to buy your grass fed meat from another Bitcoiner and, you know, to the extent possible, you want to transact with other people that share your, your values and, you know, that you're aligned with. And obviously medicine is another one where, you know, that's a very valuable service that a lot of Bitcoiners are going to need. And I'm sure I speak for most of them when I say they'd probably prefer to, uh, avail of the expertise and services of someone who, again, shares their values and principles, but who has a different, you know, uh, set of knowledge or expertise that can help them with. And importantly, is filtering that that knowledge through, you know, that perspective that they both share, you know. And um, so I'm 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 pretty sure you'll you know you'll find your way uh, if you stay at it. But one of the things that I you know I hate to say this. But it is, you know, I echo kind of your observation. I, I knew a lot of a lot of my friends went to medical school uh, growing up, and I, I'm not sure I could identify any that did it for the cause of, you know, wanting to make a meaningful impact in the health and vitality of people's lives. It was very much a status and income play, and you know, I shouldn't even, it's, it's not right to isolate or single them out because I think that's most of the reason, you know, that, that is the primary reason why people, you know, pursue whatever avenue today. And maybe that's always been the case, but I think we'd both agree that, you know, fiat has exacerbated the degree or dialed up the degree to which the importance of status and income, you know, is the primary criteria when you're making a career decision versus whatever, other meaning, which perhaps used to be more elevated or used to be more fundamental. And that seems to become, you know, far less important. And again, those, those incentives that I alluded to at the beginning are a huge reason for that, I think, because you're just, you're not as incentive as much. And the culture has moved away from being grounded in, you know, use, use the term spiritual. I think everything ultimately 
converges in that domain, whether you see it through the lens of a, you know, more so-called new age spirituality or, or non-institutionalized spirituality, or whether you do so through one of the traditional faiths, everything, I mean, that's why they exist, because they are the grounding place where you're supposed to determine these things and upon which I think you're, by which you're supposed to make your decisions and upon which you're supposed to perhaps build your life, all kind of in accord or, you know, connected to or in sync with, with those principles. And, you know, at m many people, for one, don't have a real spirituality today, let's say. And so the, perhaps that's one of the reasons why, you know, their actions and their decisions aren't and can't be grounded in that because it's not a framework that they've developed or that they have. And of these incentives that we talked about and the in institutions that arise around them, I mean, for if for your whole life, that's kind of what's inculcated in you, you know, status and income. And you're you're just told to take orders, and this will lead into some of the, the the COVID stuff. I mean, when it comes time to make that decision, you're you're playing to those incentives. You know, what incentives are gonna are gonna elevate me the most? And unfortunately, I think it's perhaps um, the outcome of that is more egregious in medicine because people do have patients have such a, an expectation of their care providers that they are supposed to be highly concerned with their well being. And the assumption, and I, you know, I, I don't know why people would make it at this point because I think we're so far down the wrong road, but it still is the case for most people, I would assume, or I would assert, is that they assume the doctor, one, is, is looking out for their best interest to the extent that they can, and two, has the capacity to do so, right? The, the, the presumption is that their education allows them to give them the best care possible. And unfortunately, I think both of those assumptions are probably wrong. And, um, you know, I, that's why I, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because it's it's so great that by whatever means, but it's in, in your case, obviously, there's a Bitcoin element to it, that a different approach is now being sought, you know, where you're taking your formal education, you're, all, you're also engaging in continuing education and, and looking at those, you know, um, heretofore taboo issues in Western medicine. Like if you're, if you're trained, you know, at a, at a medical school in the Western tradition, if you look at Chinese medicine, or if you look at acupuncture, if you look at natural medicine, you're like a kook or a quack or something, yeah. you, you know, your colleagues are going to laugh at you. But yeah. if you're actually committed to what are the constituents of health, of being strong and vital and fostering longevity and all that kind of stuff, what are they? And, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not I'm not going to narrow my scope just because my colleagues are going to laugh at me or because they don't think it's necessary or because the insurance companies yeah. won't pay for it or whatever. If you're truly interested in the, the health and well-being of of the patient that you're you're treating, I think it's natural to look at all those things. So I definitely commend you on, you know, on doing so. What was I read your piece about kind of when COVID arose and the mandates came later. What was that whole experience like for you? So both, I'd love to get your take on what the truth, at least in your, where you were working at the time of the, how serious quote unquote COVID was like the people that, you know, were coming in for legitimate treatment. Um, and then the experience with uh, the mandates, because, you know, that was well crazy all around, but you know, your experience, you were caught up in it as well. And so I'd love to hear more about your experience. Yeah. Um, look, when COVID started, started, you know, like, uh, people started uh, talking about it in the news and it was being spread on social media, I would say like very early 2020, like January, February, my colleagues were saying, oh, there's this virus that's been spreading in the East and it's very concerning. And I was like, oh, I've heard this before. Like nothing is really going to come of this. We've had these kinds of like false alarms in the past. Mm. Probably nothing will come of it. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> like, what ensued in the month or two after, I have to say, like, I have to be honest, in the beginning, like, I was, it was probably because I was just working so much and didn't really have the time to dig into the details of this. I was like, oh, this seems concerning. You know, uh-oh, something is going wrong in the world and it's come to our shores and we have to be very concerned about it. And actually, at the time, I was working overnight. So like my attachment to the world, it was very, uh, you know, limited. So like, I'd be working overnight and sleeping during the day. So I had very little understanding of what was actually going on day to day. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Uh, and I was doing that for like the two weeks where this all unfolded, you know, everyone was suddenly being told, uh, you know, we have to potentially lock down society. We have to, uh, everyone in the hospital needs to start where I met. They started first, they started uh, suggesting to staff that we need to start wearing masks in the hospital. And then soon after they made that suggestion, the staff were just stealing boxes of masks that were available in the supply room. So quickly, like no one had access to masks. So, you know, when you start to see people panic, it's hard not to get caught up in that, you know, like everyone around you is starting to scurry. Like, what are you going to do? Stand still and wait for something to hit you? Like, it, it's not, uh, it's like, a, it's primal. It's not well thought out. So at first I was like, uh oh, something is going on. And I was really um, committed to it in the sense that I thought, okay, something is of emergency status in my profession, and this is what I signed up for. So I better prepare myself mentally and physically to deal with whatever is going to come. Um, and that's the perspective I took on it in the beginning. So when you know, outpatient services were shut down. It was only emergency only. They were only concerned about people coming through the emergency department that had symptoms of a respiratory illness. And this was all developing while I was working overnight. And I thought, okay, fine. You know what? You know, like when there's a fire, the firefighter doesn't say, oh, no, it got serious now. I'm going to go home and like wait until this blows over. And I would say a handful of my colleagues shared this opinion, most of them happily took the time to stay at home and stay away from, you know, sick people. Um, but there were a few of us who thought, okay, yeah, this is our call to arms. So we might as well bear arms and go fight whatever it is this invisible enemy is. Mm -hmm. And the elaborate nature uh, was very um, enthralling. It wasn't just the fear element of it. There was also like the community element of it. Like, I was in New York City at the time. And the community element of it involved everything from food trucks coming by the hospital providing meals for everyone that was working that day for free it involved uh your neighbors sticking their head out the windows and balconies and uh cheering on the workers that were going for the shift change like it felt like it was like everyone was in it together mm -hmm. so it was actually quite a like a motivating and rewarding experience because i thought oh wow i'm like uh <laughs> I'm part of something positive and we're helping the community deal with this uh, emergency. Um, and that was great. You know, like I thought that that's how things should be. You know, if there's an emergency and you've decided to take arms against the emergency and at the very least, your community is supporting you in this endeavor, kind of like you might have during a war effort, right. not unlike, I guess, <laughs> in a war effort. Um, but then they started asking us to, kind of cover other departments, help with certain emergency, you know, either it's the emergency department, it's the, it's the medicine floors, which is like where people get admitted for, you know, you come in with some sort of illness that, you know, you don't require very intensive care, but sending you home might not be the best thing. So they'll just admit you to what we call the floors, or it was the surgical department, wherever it is that people need to help. I started helping different departments. And I started to see that what we were doing to these patients wasn't ideal and worse than ideal it was probably contributing to their to their deterioration and people talk about things like you know we were ventilating people very early like intubating them not giving them the proper medications there's that like for sure there's that that probably played a large part in cranking up the mortality data early on but then there were other small things you know like People probably don't take this as seriously, but I truly believe that this is a huge contributor to people getting better or worse is that there was no connection to humanity, you know, other than through your iPad, you might be able to talk to your family member on your deathbed. The nurse wasn't allowed to spend more than 10, 15 minutes with you because of precautions. Um, you really saw nobody. You were just in this artificially lit room. There were lines hanging out of your arms and different orifices where doctors put certain things to manage fluid intake and output and all these things. And then, you know, you got so little attention that these lines were starting to get clogged. And when you were bleeding, someone wouldn't notice. And when something went Jesus. wrong, there wasn't enough care 
literal care, like just attention, eyes on you for you to notice when things needed to be addressed. And what happens when you don't address those things? You deteriorate. Like you could come in to the hospital, you, a perfectly healthy person, you could come in with, let's say, like an infection in your finger or your ear or something, and there's a line in one of your in one of your vessels. That line gets clogged, nobody notices. Another infection brews, and now you have an infection in your bloodstream. And an infection in your bloodstream can quickly escalate to something that even a healthy person could not, let's say, the chances of their recovery is... Uh, is is lo low enough that a totally healthy person could not make it out of that hospital if, right. if, if i worded that properly yeah that's i get it um so attention is important and when you remove attention from people who are sick especially people who are really sick because that's the only people we're admitting yeah of course they're gonna die like and that's where i thought okay like i get it you guys are scared but we've been at this for weeks and months so maybe you can give these people who are sick and have no one else some care and attention. But that, no, was due, that's... that was due to fear of, of catching the virus or just overburden of the resources available. Fear of catching the virus. Like everyone would talk about that. Even like everything from the, the early intubation, oh, we don't want them to get to a state where we have to do chest compressions and they're blowing air into our face while we're compressing their chest. Uh, don't spend more than 15 minutes in the room with them. Make sure you look like uh, an alien when you walk into the room so that the person doesn't see anything humane emanating off of you. You know, full gown. Every, look, that's not a normal thing to see. <laughs> and you can tell when you wear all these equipment and you go in front of a dog and they get scared and start barking or an infant that's never seen this before. They get really concerned. Like it's a natural instinct. This isn't a human in front of me. It's some sort of alien dressed in something else that is not normal. Right. And the same thing happens when a person is severely ill, like they, they're looking for a human touch. And I personally, I think hospitals serve one good purpose, maybe out of a couple. But one thing I think hospitals do is they get people, the care providers get together and disseminate the suffering of one patient. Mm. You have a nurse, you have someone who helps with bedding, with urination, with food, you have the doctor, you have consultants. This one person who's really sick is like this concentrated ball of pain and suffering. And you use all of these people and you disseminate, you spread it so that everyone can tolerate it. But when you have this, this density of suffering and there's no one around, then it's all on them. Mm. It's all on them psychologically. It's all on them spiritually, physically. I, I truly believe that that, that, that is a major contributor to recovery. So mm -hmm. when you don't provide that to people, then they don't recover and then they continue spiraling. And we haven't even gotten to like the criteria by which people would be admitted to even receive the minimal care that was provided for them in the hospital. And then eventually you started seeing, you know, the contrarian healthcare provider saying, look, if you have COVID, don't go to the hospital, go to a clinic or take this medication, you know, like whether people were pushing hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, vitamins, sunlight, diet, you know, all these things. And for good reason, because there was a part where going to the hospital was almost a death sentence. Like there, most people didn't make it out, like, including our own staff. You know, like it, it wasn't just that the outside population was being treated with this level of low care. Staff that people know and love in the hospital who got sick and were admitted were treated pretty much the same way. And they would die in ways that, you know, that were preventable. Like you just had to pay attention to them and keep an eye on them and see what they were doing and how they were evolving. But that just wasn't being done. And at, in in the initial stages or or throughout this whole period, was there a genuine like um like a huge uptick in people with you know with genuine because obviously with any hysteria, you know, like some people they get the sniffles they go to the hospital immediately other people they'll be on their deathbed on their couch before they actually go to the hospital you know but when when a hysteria takes hold obviously the 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 number of people within that whatever population that deem it to be worthy enough to go to the hospital dramatically goes up because they think they have this you know uh you know deadly virus and so were there 
you know, one more people coming through the hospital as a result of that? And how many would you say were like, it was legitimately the virus was that much more severe than a typical virus and they were rightly in the hospital or how many were there because, you know, fear had con consumed them and they, they probably could have just, you know, taken care of themselves at home had they not been so, you know, panicked. Yeah, I am. Um... You know, my instinct tells me that you're right, that when this kind of hysteria catches up with people, more and more of them, their threshold goes down for seeking medical attention. But to be honest with you, because of the way that we throttled healthcare, like there were tents outside, we, for example, if you were come to the emergency department and there was any concern of you having COVID, you would get some imaging done, like a chest x-ray or something or you would have to get a lab drawn, all those things had protocols put into place that would make that chest x-ray and that lab acquisition and processing much more cumbersome and delayed. So I don't know to what element the lineups we were seeing outside of the hospital were a natural function of more people coming or because we had placed artificial bottlenecks in the admission process. What I do know is when I was working in the emergency department and evaluating people very early on, this was like, I think March, that were concerned that they might have COVID. A lot of people just came in with, you know, a cough, some sniffles, maybe a fever. And they were saying, oh, you know, I just came to see if, you know, I had COVID uh, and if there's anything you guys could do for me. And most of them were, prob were very disappointed to find that because they weren't ill enough, we weren't even testing them with whatever tests they had dispensed at the time. Right. One of so, the, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, that was all. I was going to say one of the, um, well, one of the things that contributed to the hysteria, which I think in hindsight, and even at the time there was rumblings as that this was happening, perhaps not across the board, but certainly in some places, um, you had the whole, you know, death by COVID, death with COVID distinction in terms of the hospitals reporting. Now, of course, if you have a majority of hospitals recording all recording as a COVID death, someone who died with COVID but not by it, you're going to have a way out of whack number in terms of how deadly this virus is. And then you're going to obviously fuel the hysteria. In your experience, I mean, was that even something that you would uh, interface with in terms of stats and recordings? Is it something that you noticed or what was your, t you know, what was going on in your world at the time with that issue? So at the time, the, the chief of my department, he was closely involved with a lot of the hospital policies that were coming down. So I would get some feedback as to like why and how they were processing information and people. And it's true what people have been saying is that if you were to attach a COVID diagnosis to an admission or a death, there would be some sort of reimbursement associated with it that would benefit the hospital. Like I can't deny that. I'm I've seen the numbers, I know the policies, and that's an unfortunate reality. Uh, when one of my friends who was in Chicago at the time, he asked me if that was true. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should look into that. And he was right that that's that that was happening. Personally, the way I would interact with this and I would see people being labeled as COVID patients, <laughs> for example, in the electronic health record, when I would look up information, um, I would see that people have uh, been diagnosed with COVID pneumonia because of a test. But if you look at their, like their chest X-ray or their chest CT, and you look at their lungs, the lungs are fine. There's like, there's no respiratory infection there, but they're still diagnosed with pneumonia, and pneumonia is an infection of the lungs. So how could you be diagnosed with COVID pneumonia and not have anything in your lungs at the same time, and not actually, in some cases, have any respiratory complaints whatsoever? So you know the joke or the meme or whatever that was circulating online at the time where you would go in and uh, you'd be labeled as a COVID death, but like you came in with a broken bone because of a car wreck. I mean, I didn't see that kind of stuff personally, but I could see the steps in the process that that would lead to that kind of outcome mm -hmm. and that kind of documentation. Um, but in terms of like the nitty gritty details about the quantity of reimbursement and um, 
whether or not some people like I, I'm sure lots of people were admitted that had COVID were just PCR positive because like, for example, when I'm reading chest x-rays, the emergency department would call me up and say, hey, this person tested positive for COVID. Do they have anything in their lungs? I would say no. Well, they're still going to get admitted into a COVID ward because right. they have a PCR that people assume is like diagnostic of a disease. So this person's being put in a COVID ward. They're being counted as a COVID patient and all reporting that gets reported up to public health agencies, to the local health authorities that's going to be disseminated to the public on the news and on the daily fear numbers. Like that's for all intents and purposes, this person is a COVID patient. And it really just comes down to the question of like, what is a COVID patient? Well, we can get down to the the deeper rabbit hole of like, what is a virus? But really, if a COVID patient is someone that's been defined as having COVID by a test, and that is your diagnostic criteria for COVID, then yeah, these are all COVID patients. Mm. It doesn't matter that they came in with gallbladder inflammation or intestinal infection or a cough or a broken bone. They are COVID patients as far as the information receiving element of society is concerned, because they've all been categorized as such by the thing that categorizes people into COVID or not COVID. It's crazy how much reliance there was on the PCR test, you know, to make these diagnoses. But as you say, then transmit that information out into the public, right? Like that single, that single criteria, which was a PCR test, which as you just said, may have no relevance whatsoever to, whatsoever to the health of the patient, right? They may be in basically perfect health, but with a positive PCR test, that feeds into the numbers you see on the news, that feeds into the hysteria, that feeds into all the downstream negative consequences of the, the hysteria. Did you, I mean, do you have any special knowledge about the PCR test, its accuracy, the cycle count. I mean, I know very little about it, but mm -hmm. it obviously was the linchpin of 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 the scale of this thing. And there was, you know, there was obviously a lot of criticism at the time. I don't know how how credible uh, Kerry Mullis is. I think he was the creator of of the test, right? How, you know, how credible is his judgment or skepticism of it? Because he was obviously very skeptical uh, skeptical of it. And others who said, you know, it's not being done properly, even if it's being done properly, it is insufficient of a diagnostic mm -hmm. method. You know, what was your take on on that? Yeah, like I so in undergrad, I one of the things that I studied was molecular biology and some of the labs we did and the things we learned were concerned with different types of molecular tests. And that included PCR. And, you know, the same thing when I was in medical school, I did some neurosurgical research. And in that, you know, we did DNA analysis, RNA analysis, microRNA analysis. So I have some background in this, like I'm not a expert. <laughs> I would never call myself an expert in this, but I think I have enough practical knowledge. And that comes to like a point about doctors and medical education broadly is that just people don't have the necessary understanding of the things that are now permeating the entire field to be able to make judgments about this. So for example, I would ask my colleagues, what do you think it means when a PCR test is positive? And invariably they would just say, oh, it means you have COVID. And like, no, that doesn't mean that because, because of the way the test works and Terry Mullis had criticisms of its applications before his death for decades. And I think based on, I mean, the guy invented the test or not the test, he invented the process of amplification of genetic material, essentially. And the way that this test works is you take, you take some genetic material, you break it up, and then you put in these enzymes. And these enzymes will, if they find a match for the string of gene code they're looking for, they will make copies of that fragment. And if you make enough copies, then the well, it gets a little complicated because like the way that this works is you stratify the gene based on uh, the code, the fragments based on their size in a, in essentially a gel. And then you run a current through it. And depending on the size, the length of the gene fragment, it will migrate a certain distance from one end of the circuit to the other end of the circuit. So you break up all these genes, you amplify them, and then that's one way of analyzing whether or not you have certain uh, you have certain, uh, it's hard to say, cause it's not like you're specifically testing for a gene. That's more like a, like a Western blot where you'll have just gene fragments, but with PCR, 
the the innovation in that is that you take certain genes, you break them up, and then you put primers that will attach to the gene if it finds the gene that it's looking for. I shouldn't say gene, the DNA code that it's looking for, and then it will just make copies. And if you make enough copies, the thing that you're looking at will start to fluoresce because there's enough concentration that it's visible to us. If it doesn't meet a certain concentration, then effectively for our visual system, it won't be visible. So depending on the number of cycles you have to do to make it visible, that's where you kind of set a threshold for, okay, this is my threshold for this this gene being present in a sufficient quantity that I would be concerned about its presence. And the threshold that you set, the number of cycles that it has to go through, is a predictor of whether or not the amount of load of that gene is of concern. So people talk about viral load. Mm -hmm. What it means is how much of virus, and virus is just like the genetic instruction. It doesn't mean anything else. It's a string of gene that is present. So how much of viral load is present for us to be concerned? And the problem is with SARS-1, we didn't use PCR to diagnose SARS. We just use clinical assessment as you would, because a person comes in, they look sick. Do you have the symptoms of something that looks like SARS? Then we might do a test to confirm whether or not you have SARS. But with SARS-2, we skip the clinician. We just put this test. And now this test that is oversensitive, the threshold was very low, such that the number of cycles that had to be generated before you would say, okay, this is an insufficient quantity of viral load for us to be concerned was high. So if the cycle threshold is 20, that means you go through 20 cycles of amplification before the test becomes positive. If the cycle threshold is 40, then you go through 40 cycles of amplification before the test is positive. So typically for something like influenza or SARS-1 or other tests, we would put them somewhere between 20 and 25 because we thought, okay, if you need more cycles to amplify it, then there isn't enough for us to be concerned. Mm. But now you're putting it to 40. So I saw some protocols for, for certain health agencies, 45. I mean, above 35, you're just looking at noise. Like, cause there's always going to be something present in in any fluid sample you take. And what most people don't know, they just think like viruses are this thing that exists inside this little encased particle that we see pictures of and we think that that's a virus. But like genetic information, this is the thing that is communicated by living organisms everywhere all the time. Like there's probably genetic information in your water that you drink from the tap or from a bottle. There's genetic information on every surface. So to think that viruses only exist in these little discrete bundles is a misunderstanding of virology. And unfortunately, most people don't know this because this is how it's taught, my colleagues included. They believe that viruses are these encapsulated organisms that are very, very small, that we can't see, that don't have a metabolism. But really, viruses are just genetic instruction. They're just, just like on a computer, you know, a computer code that's a virus is just instruction to make the computer do something that might not be beneficial for the computer or for the user of that computer or the person who owns that computer. Or like a mind virus, it's just an idea. Like, that's just an instruction. Mm -hmm. Do this and this will happen. Like, these are all just instructions. And when it comes to infectious viruses, it's pretty much the same thing. So when you're taking instructions... And then you're just amplifying them and you're saying, oh, this instruction was present at a very minuscule quantity, but you are ill with COVID. And that's where it starts to get so hairy that uh, most people will just ignore it. Like everyone I brought this up to just ignored it. Like despite what I would tell them about the sensitivity of these tests, the positive predictive value of these tests, um, they would just, they would hear it. And then they say, oh, that's interesting. And then forget about it. And then go about their lives as if these tests are sent down from the heavens and is the de facto way in which we diagnose stuff. Um, something that I read at the time that I think would be interesting, like if you don't have symptoms and you test someone for COVID and at an amplification cycle that high, 
the likelihood that they are ill with this disease, if it's positive, is so tiny that you cannot make any practical decisions based on this. If they are ill and it's still test positive with this 40 amplification cycle test, there's like, I think it's in the single digit probability that they actually have this disease. That's with symptoms. So if it's that uh, inaccurate and invalid when people are ill, just imagine how useless it is when people have no symptoms. Like it, it boggles the mind that this was, it was just like snuck in, you know, like under the radar and nobody paid attention to it. Well, I think it's, um, I mean, I'm sure there's many reasons. I mean, one of the things, again, that we we opened up with was these perverse fiat incentives and the, you know, all the institutions that arise on top of them, you know, I'm sure we'll touch on a, f a few others of them as we go along in this conversation. But, you know, um, one of them, as you said, with the recording requirements, it's like, would would that actually happen if you didn't have either state sponsored medicine or the insurance system as it is, or all the other um, constituencies and it's, and incentives that are driving them to record it that way. You, you, you probably wouldn't, you would probably have, uh, there would probably be a greater adherence to what is accurate and, and more truthful. And again, with, with the issue that, that we brought up before, and that you said about, you know, your colleagues, when you first got into medical school, they're kind of, they're, they're used to, and it's easier just to, to follow the, just to follow orders, follow whatever the orthodoxy is, is from on high. Who am I like, I, what, why do I want to rock the boat? You know, it's come down from the who and to my national center for disease control and to the hospital, uh, administration and to each doctor, like, really, I'm going to like confront that entire architecture or pyramid or whatever. Hell no. Like that's, the, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up to do a job and, and stay within this, this kind of lane. And if I stay within that lane, then I have, you know, uh, social uh, confirmation. And I have, you know, basically my ass is covered on all levels. If I don't step outside of that lane, no one's going to get me. I'm good. If I do step out of that lane, then my whole world is, is basically turned upside down because nobody else is doing it. And I have no support there. I have no protection, all that kind of stuff. And so you can easily see, you know, again, like I'm, I'm not a big, um, I don't know how to put this because I, I don't, I don't want to act as though conspiracies don't exist, but I'm not a big, like the people in the dark room determining how things are going to go down sort of person. But I am a very big, you create a set of false incentives or distorted incentives or incentives coming from a particular area of society markets, what have you. And then you just naturally get, um, constituencies that build up around that and they be, they become so artificially large and their agendas become uh their agendas converge right so it becomes a, a conspiracy of incentives or a conspiracy of of interests rather than a conspiracy you know that's just the devil doing his work but it becomes like it it becomes advantageous for the news organizations to report higher numbers because more people are then watching them it becomes advantageous for the pcr you know, creators, it becomes advantageous for the politicians because, you know, they're, then they're confirming the the who and, you know, so the, there's so much wrapped up in it. And so, again, I think, you know, that's just another example of of the insidious nature of of when incentives are not tethered to truth things go awry. And, and, and I think, you know, the silver lining with COVID, as I've been saying a lot lately, is I think it was a pardon the pun, but mask off moment for a lot of people, you know, the red pill moment, because they saw in hindsight, unfortunately, for a lot of people, but at least in hindsight, saw that, you know, the, the degree of incompetence, the degree of collusion and corruption, the degree of lack of true adherence to, to principles, you know, um, and many other things that have caused them to dial down their degree of trust in these institutions, which I think is at least a step in the right direction in helping them to figure out a way to uh, avoid having to rely on them in the future and avoid the influence of those institutions uh, on their life. And that's probably a good segue into when the mandates came through, because you know that's obviously something that you had to confront as a, as a care provider. So why don't you dig into the extent that you, you, you wanna share that experience? Yeah, so when, the the mandates that first came out, you know, 
if I'm recalling the timeline correctly, it's been a few years now. The sequence that they came out in was, um, uh, you know, first the vaccines were available and people were encouraged to get vaccinated. Then certain places of business would restrict entry based on vaccination status. Then travel to certain parts of the world were restricted by vaccination status. And previously, these things were restricted based on based on test results. I don't know to what extent places of business were admitting people based on PCR test results, but I think there was some. I mm. even had, you know, friends uh, who didn't want us to come for Christmas dinner unless we had taken a oh, rapid yeah. test there or was something. A ton, there was a lot like, of that kind of shit. Um, but for us, it had already been at a point where. Um, it had been a point where the vaccine mandates had rolled out. So if I'm recalling correctly, in mid-2021, my employer started saying, you know, we want people to get vaccinated. It would be good for this, that, and the other thing. If you're not going to get it, we're going to have to have you do a PCR test every week, every two weeks, whatever, a couple times a week. The policies would always change. Mm. And I said, okay, well, I'll just do the test. I've been doing the test anyway, so I might as well do it. And then they start saying, okay, well, you know what, starting August or July or something of 2021, if you don't have a vaccine, at least one dose of the vaccine, then you can't come to work. And they found that compliance was relatively low at the time. So they pushed the date to September and then October. And then at that point, I thought, okay, look, like, I've probably had this thing that everyone's afraid of because I've been working with these patients. Like, keep in mind, one of the hospitals I was working at was an only COVID hospital. Like, only the people admitted were COVID positive patients. So, we talk about they, viral they load. Had shut down all their other services, or yes. Yeah. yes, yeah, they weren't admitting anyone else for any other purpose. They had no outpatient facilities or services, and this is like a community hospital where. I don't know, I want to say over half a million people in New York City relied on for their care and people who are, for all intents and purposes, they're impoverished. You know, they don't have good insurance. They can't go to any hospital or any clinic. So this entire facility is shut down except for COVID purposes. And anyway, I've been exposed to these people day in and day out for weeks and months and probably over a year at this point. And now they're telling me that unless I am vaccinated, I cannot work. And I thought, okay, well, this is weird. Like, why would you, why would you treat us this way? Because on the one hand, when they were asking for us to volunteer to help with different services, we were being congratulated as like heroes and stuff. Like I even have the emails that were sent to my department from the department that was looking for help, kind of like as praise, like, oh, X, this person and this person and this person were the first to volunteer uh, we would just want it to, you know, publicly praise them for whatever purpose. And then like a year later, and this is almost like coincidental, the same person who had asked us to help was also now enforcing these new policies. So they were like threatening us with <laughs> getting fired for not getting this vaccine. <laughs> just I thought, you, you know, I'm like the same person you congratulated <laughs> like a year ago in the same email <laughs> chain. Just to jut in for a second, but you know, based on how much you and your colleagues were treating COVID patients, am I right in assuming that a lot of you had already gotten COVID for, from so much exposure to, to people with it at that point when yeah, the mandates I mean, came through? Yeah, there's, there's a few ways of looking at it. You can either say, okay, you've been sick and in contact with these people, you tested positive on this test, you're fine. You've developed your own immunity towards it, or mm -hmm. you haven't been sick, which just means you're not susceptible. Like, right. I, I'm breathing their air and right. I'm not getting sick. And, you know, at the time, there were also physicians who were pointing to T cell immunity, which is like a cellular type of immunity, which, especially in the case of COVID, they have found many studies now over years that certain people just don't generate a strong enough antibody response. And that's because their cellular immunity is so robust against this thing that they don't create the molecular signature that would say, oh, you've been infected and you've had antibodies that were made in response to this. Your cells just take care of it. 
And that also exists. So if a person has been exposed to COVID patients and only COVID patients for a year, they're either immune from having been sick or they're immune because they're just not susceptible to this thing because right. of whatever makes up their cellular immunity makes it robust enough against this specific thing that it's not a concern. But like they didn't even want to look at antibody titers to see if you had already been infected and have robust immunity, let alone consider the possibility of like cellular immunity. So yeah, the, the few colleagues of mine that were skeptical um, and adamant that they didn't want this thing. Like I had one colleague <clears throat> who was also kind of in the same boat as me and he's very much, you know, freedom oriented, you know, like I, I would call him like a libertarian. He was telling me that one of the reasons that he didn't want to get it is because one of his friends from medical school, who's a very healthy, fit person, didn't wake up from his sleep the morning after one of his injections. And he just passed away. So like his concern is totally legitimate. Like, I don't want this thing. Yeah. If it can do this to a friend of mine who I know and who's very healthy, then why would I take this risk? And I had at that point, because I had resisted for so long, I'd kind of like accumulated stories from friends and acquaintances of theirs of what happened to them after they had gotten these injections. And I thought, I don't want this. I don't want my wife to get this. And at the time, my wife was pregnant, so I definitely don't want her to get it because she might pass this on to our unborn child, which we're now finding is also a possibility. Mm. So <clears throat> there was all the motivation in the world to not get it. So I started to go on this, uh, what now, you know, in retrospect was a futile attempt to avoid it, you know, all sorts of exemptions. Uh, the, the two that they allowed in New York State was either a medical exemption or a religious exemption. And I tried to get either one. The religious exemption was just, denied outright like i don't know anyone in our hospital that was able to get a religious exception and the part of new york where i was at there was a lot of orthodox religious people so if they couldn't get it then how was i going to get it mm -hmm. they were just it was just a blanket and like you know you would talk to colleagues and administrators like oh religious exemptions are a joke why would anyone legitimize such a thing and i thought like man you guys are so far off the <laughs> I, I train that, that you don't realize how I, important this is to society right yeah exactly and i found that so not not surprising at the time but very telling because you know in in the predominantly secular liberal culture that we we live in today there's a you know there's a signal of of religious tolerance right like yeah of mm -hmm. course religious tolerance and sexual preference and all this kind of stuff but when push comes to shove those same people are like come on Come on, mm -hmm. like yeah, not, exactly, exactly. Not, it's it's not really kind of... a thing. It's you know, we just we just say it, you know, because you're supposed to say <laughs> yeah, it. But yeah. don't don't come on, do do what you're supposed to do. This religious yeah. stuff is bullshit. You can't use that in this excuse. It's no, it's really an indicator of like how far gone that microcosm of society is when they just exactly. think that it's a joke that you would have a religious objection to something. Right. Like as it, if it's so illegitimate in 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 their <laughs> minds. That's you know, I agree. That's how that's how untethered you know things have become exactly. from yeah, that yeah. grounding that we were alluding to earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like that's when I thought like, uh oh, this is going to be an uphill battle when people are just <laughs> laughing at the idea that uh, you know I I and I use the same. <clears throat> I have lots of reasons for why I didn't want this to have an impact on my child, and you know, like subsequent injections, but like that to me is. Uh, you can call, you don't have to call it religious it's spiritual for lack of a better term it's i don't think that people are born imperfect in such a way that only some guy who worked in a lab can fix like right. that how uh how like how cynical of creation and of existence we have to be to think that some guy in a lab who's probably working for the wrong incentives has the solution to a defect that we've invented in a human body. <laughs> it's just such a, it's such a stretch to me. And like, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, I've, uh, I've had my tango with atheism when I was younger, like early in college, like most many people in that age range do. But it wasn't until I saw all of the unraveling of society in the last, I don't know, like 10 years that I realized how important religion was. 
So when my people, one of the people at work, they laughed at the idea of a religious exemption. And they didn't even just laugh. Some of them were angry that anyone would suggest that there's a religious reason or objection to partaking in this mass population experiment. I, I, I should have taken that as a stronger indicator of what was to come than I did at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so like I went through the exemption attempts, those didn't work. And then at the time I was also, you know, I was wrestling with a health condition, like an autoimmune problem. And this autoimmune problem had flared at the time. I don't know if it's because of the stress of all the things that were being threatened on me and my family. Uh, I'm sure it was related, but um, yeah, the, like I was given a week exemption. I was like, you, and the person who, yeah, the person who is, uh, and the person who was dealing with my case, they were a specialist in autoimmune disease. And they gave me a week exemption to deal with this autoimmune disease. I was like, are you serious? Like, do you know how much of a joke? Like either you believe that autoimmune disease is what it is, or you don't. Either you're a specialist in this or you're not, but you can't say that, oh yeah, you have a legitimate medical reason not to get it, but I'm giving you a week to get over it. Crazy. Like, are you just giving me a week to come to terms with the fact that I'm well, not going to get an exemption? Like, what is this? Absolutely. That's exactly what it was, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, all right, these people aren't very serious, nor can they be reasoned with. And at that point, I was just going to, I thought, I guess rather naively, uh, let's see how far they're willing to take this. So I saw how far they were willing to take it. They went as far as calling my doctor who was dealing, who like who I'm the patient of with this illness that I have and posing as my physician to get my health records to then deny my exemption. Like they went oh, as far as doing uh, that. Yeah. And when I called her, my doctor and I said, hey, did you give this information to this other person from my institution? He's like, yeah, they told me they're your doctor. I was like, what? No, they're not my doctor. They're, they work for the occupational health. I have no patient physician relationship with them. And they just posed as my physician to get information from you. What was their response to that? Just ignoring it. Like as if it was, instead of worrying about that, my doctor then started to tell me about how I should take this vaccine. Right. Well, it was good. It was for a good reason. So, you know, of course, give yeah, a yeah. pass on that one. Yeah. Yeah. They were totally justified in that. So that's how they just, and then when I called the person from occupational health, I said, Hey, my doctor told me that you posed as my physician to get health information from them. And she just like flippantly admitted to it and pretended like it was nothing. I mean, not uh, legal issues are, are, are touchy, so I don't want to, but like, is that not grounds for some form of legal action? Oh yeah. 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 But like, you know, I, I tried to file, <laughs> I tried to file a complaint and you have to jump through a million different hoops to do something like this. And at the time I had enough on my plate already. So I was like, all right, like, there's no way this is going to be dealt with in a time period that I mm can make anything of it like i'm facing termination within the next couple of days unless i can make something happen so i was going through all of my options i started contacting lawyers and law groups that were dealing with this i think there was one something liberty something that was kind of they were trying to guide people in these uh circumstances i think it was called liberty council they were trying to guide people in these circumstances i got in touch with one lawyer <clears throat> who was from New York City, but he had moved to Florida because he was an early proponent of uh, outpatient treatment for COVID and was supporting physicians who wanted to do this. And he started, he and his family started getting so many threats, he moved them to Florida. Like if, <laughs> if an established lawyer from a law firm who's helping physicians deal with this stuff is already facing the kind of backlash, I thought, okay, so this is how far they're willing to take it. And I think I had to learn that. I had to go through that to be at peace with letting go of this field mm -hmm. or at least this way of practicing this specialty, you know, like this profession. Um, yeah, it was really eye-opening. So I was like, I was out of a job for 
three months. You, you, you were, you were terminated or you just, you know, they were yeah, like, well, you can't come back unless, oh, you were terminated. Okay. Yeah. I was terminated one week before my son was born. So I was like, huh, well, I guess I get to spend time at home with my wife and son, which, right. and then that's when I started remnant MD, which was like a few days after he was born. I thought, okay, well, I have nothing Lean else in. to do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so what happened then? So I started writing and I took my health very seriously because my concern was legitimately, my concern was an interaction with this thing that is immunogenic and my autoimmune disease. So I started learning <clears throat> as much as I could from the people that I was able to encounter online and find, you know, this kind of opened the door for me to think about health in different ways than I had been indoctrinated into thinking. Because if, you know, if this element of this profession is flimsy at best, then what other element of this profession is flimsy? Where else are the foundations much more shaky than I had previously given credit for? Because like I'd never taken infectious disease very seriously to the extent that I would dig into the foundations of that specialty and see like, is there strength here or is everything like a house of cards kind of construction? And when I did, I realized, hmm, yeah, maybe germ theory is not all that it's cracked up to be, or maybe infectious disease as a specialty is not all it's cracked up to be. And then I found out that autoimmunity is also not all it's cracked up to be. And the diseases that we're told we have to live with for life and constantly be seen, like this is the, what I was fed as a patient in this infrastructure, you know, that like you're going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life increases your chance of cancer, you have to get screening for this and that cancer. I thought, oh, wow, this is a very serious diagnosis. So then I thought, well, okay, well, what if autoimmune diseases aren't what I thought they were? And what if X and Y and Z, like it just kept unraveling piece by piece. So <clears throat> when I realized that I might have a better grasp on this, I changed my life to such a way that I thought, okay, maybe this is going to have an impact on my life that would be beneficial. So I tried certain things, like I started just eating meat, for example, mm. or avoiding certain things in my diet. And lo and behold, within a few months, my symptoms had disappeared and I was off meds and they haven't come back in, we're almost going on two years now. Wow. So when I had fixed my autoimmune disease, which, you know, maybe the exemption should have been a few months, not one week, I could have cured it by that. I don't know. <laughs> When I had fixed it, I thought, okay, like now I can take this thing and I have to get back to work because I have a family that needs to be provided for. So I thought, okay, like I'm going to take a shot. I had toyed, like people had toyed with the idea and had offered to me like, hey, you know, like if you really don't want to take it, there's this avenue and that, you know, like, like illicit avenues, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I thought, look, like if I'm going to fight with this beast, I'm going to fight with it. I'm not going to like cheat my way out of this problem. So when I felt like my body was in good enough shape to tolerate this stress, this immune stress, I got the Johnson & Johnson injection, one and done, didn't want to go for anything else. I got that, I went back to work. And then after I got back to work, like, Two months later, they're like, oh, we're putting a booster mandate in place now. So if you had gotten the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine and you're, I think it was like six months out from your last dose, it's time for your booster. And if you don't get your booster, you're going to get fired. And I thought, oh my God. And then for the Johnson and Johnson, they did two months. So I just got back hired after getting vaccinated and like, okay, in two months, you have to get a booster. Otherwise you're fired again. Fuck. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I, how do you guys keep justifying this and luckily you know my colleagues were a lot more skeptical this time and some of them knew what I had been through so they reached out to me for some guidance and whatever and I and you know I, it's not like I had a successful bout against the system it, and for you know, it was like a learning experience. Like, what is this beast that I'm dealing with? And what is it that I have to have prepared the next time I want to fight with it? Because I'd never done this before. I'd never mm -hmm. taken on this much heat from administration uh, and from a major institution. So I kind of went into the first round unprepared. 
So when people came to me asking me for advice, I just, I told them my experience. I told them how far they're willing to go to make them kneel and what it is they would have to be willing to put up with. And it turns out that lots of people had hesitation the second time around with the boosters. And I started getting uh, contacted from many people in my department. And then another like mind blowing thing was done by the hospital wherein, so I was the chief of my department's trainees at the time. And all of the chiefs got an email in spring of 2022 with a list of everyone that hasn't gotten the booster yet. And like, this is private information of like 400 people. I was like, they're like either they've gotten comfortable with ethical violations or they're just ignorant of what an ethical violation is at this point that they just comfortably uh, emailed, I think like 70 different people, a list of 400 to 450 staff members in the hospital with their name, birth date, medical record number, vaccination status, booster status. I was like, does anyone else realize that this is just a massive, uh, like, uh, what do they call it? Class action, yeah. like lawsuit yeah. waiting to happen? Like, do right. they not know? Or they just don't care? But luckily, that was information I could use. So when my colleagues came up to me with concern, I said, look, there's 450 of you that have not gotten the booster. So you could all just, like, I have the list of people. You can, like, contact them and just collectively say no. Like, enough is enough. But at this point, it seems like a lot of the people that I had encountered, uh, maybe they've gotten like used to complying with these mandates. So, you know, what's one more? Like uh, that kind of slippery slope, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you give an inch, they take a foot or whatever the saying goes. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of them were, a lot of them scrambled by the deadline to get it. At least the ones that I knew. Not I, I didn't know most of the people on the list. And then on, so this was like the deadline was Friday. By the end of work week, Friday, you had to have submitted your status. And then at like 4 p.m. that Friday, there was a press release in the news. Oh, we've removed the mandate. And they did it obviously because not enough people, like they would have to fire half the staff mm of the hospital like there's no way that they could go through with this so they had to rescind it and then at that point man were people furious like furious and a lot of these were young women and i know tons of young women whose whose menstrual cycles have been screwed up like they're by just one shot let alone two three four, you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. the more they do the more harm it causes and the more dysregulation it induces. So most of the people in my department that approached me were females. Some of them were male, but like a lot of them were female. And for good reason, they probably had something that they didn't want to share that made them think, okay, maybe I shouldn't put more of this into my body. Man, there's, there's so much there, but you know, one of the points was just on how you treated your own autoimmune uh, condition, right? Because as you said at the beginning, one of the questions that you often want to ask people, especially in society today, it's like, from where did you get such a conviction in your perspective? Like, I'd genuinely like to know. It doesn't matter what issue we're talking about. Obviously, in this case, we're talking about the COVID stuff. But it's like, where is that confidence and conviction from? Where is it derived? And, and most people, the answer is like cultural osmosis, basically. Yes, they listen to the mainstream news, but there's also just the, the, the air, the zeitgeist of the time in terms of that particular issue. And then they, you know, it's like that NPC meme, right? They just put the microchip in the back of their head and that's their opinion. And like very few people, pick any issue you want, have actually gone, you know, and done sufficient enough research to have any degree of, you know, conviction in, or, you know, legitimate conviction in an actual perspective. And the same is true for Western medicine, right? People think Western medicine is the pinnacle of healthcare, let's say, or pinnacle of medicine, when really it's a perspective on health. And the mistake that people make is thinking that not only is it the only, but it also in many cases, the mistake they make is thinking it's the best perspective on health, mm -hmm. when clearly there are other perspectives that in many cases are 
you know, more conducive to treating underlying causes and not just one, getting rid of symptoms, you know, or, or two, treating something, you know, forever and, and, you know, instead of actually curing it again, we, this takes us back to the incentives and the, all that kind of stuff that collude to make that the case. And also to discredit anyone who's, you know, presuming to offer an, an alternative, which has been the case for a long time. It's great now that whether it's, you know, the internet and sharing information and more people experimenting on their own, the lack of trust in that particular perspective, causing people to go out on their own and experiment on, you know, on themselves. And these other approaches are emerging and, you know, they're being, they're very effective for people and that's great. Um, but I think it's, 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 it is another example of, of, you know, that singular perspective, that extremely narrow perspective mm -hmm. on a given issue. And, you you could you know it's kind of like a, a microcosm macrocosm issue with everything like when you focus another when you focus exclusively on one thing at the expense of everything else of course you're going to create a lot of other problems right like you mentioned the hospital you were in at a, at a particular point here was just only covid right so you know there's been a lot made of at least in the alternative media of the all cause mortality increasing you know uh from mid 2021 onwards mm -hmm. and i think we you know obviously the injection is an aspect of that. It's, I mean, it seems, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you, how you discern, you know, truth necessarily in that realm, but it certainly seems to be the case, but it also could very well be the case. And I'm sure it is to some degree, all those people that didn't get their diagnosis, didn't get their treatments of various things when the exclusive narrow focus was on COVID. Well, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that's going to contribute to worse outcomes for all those people. Cause where was their care when they needed it? You know, yeah. and so they, they don't get it and therefore they, they experience, you know, negative outcomes or, you know, death or the, the acceleration of the diseases or whatever it might be as a result of that, you know, uh, narrow focus on COVID. So, I mean, we could, we could speak for a long time on, uh, on all these issues, but one of the things, because we keep coming around this issue where there's no grounding in a, in a moral principle and mm -hmm. rather it seems like there's one, just a, you know, a, a following orders, you know, and the illusion is always the, the example that's always brought up, you know, like Nazi era stuff, right? It's like yeah. the soldiers will say, well, I was just following orders. And most people today will be like, you, that's a horrible excuse for doing what you did. I can't believe you do it. You know, they're very judgmental. That's what that. I was told. That's what I was told. This is yeah. like my, but, in my department, in the administration, people would tell me, I'm just, this is coming from above, essentially. Right as if the orders are being given to them by God. Like, you know, you could, like you run this place, you run this department, you run this hospital. You yeah. could just say no, but you won't. That's exactly the point that I was going to make is that, you know, when we hear of the historical examples, we just think of like, is the, does the order itself make sense? And we forget about all the incentives and the structures around and the pressures and everything that's making people oftentimes not even uh, act against their, you know, what they deem to be right, but like almost clouding what right is in that moment, mm -hmm. such that it's a far more easy decision to make. And I do think it's the case that because there's not a grounding in a, in a absolute moral principle, which some call God and others have different names for, let's say, something else always is going to take that place because we need an absolute principle against which to judge our actions. Now, Maybe it's sometimes it's not conscious, all the better that it is. But I think for a lot of people, it's unconscious now. And, you know, perhaps for a lot of these people, authority could, you know, the state and the authority that it embodies could be it. And of course, all the downstream institutions, be it the WHO, the CDC, your hospital admin, like it's all tethered to that structure and that, that power and authority structure. And so I think for a lot of people, that has become the de facto God. So like whatever it says, I'm just going to follow. That's the principle against. So if it says something is good, then I'm going to, I'm going to say it's good, but there's mm -hmm. also, you know, obviously per perhaps related to that is this science versus scientism uh, divide, you know, yeah. whereas I think a lot of people, a lot of sensible people during the, the COVID era was saying like, you know, those people putting hashtag science in their Instagram posts and Twitter posts, you're not you're not involved or engaging in science whatsoever. You're you mm -hmm. literally are just following orders, be it be it from your hospital admin, from the mainstream media, or from the government. You're not engaging in science. 
But this notion of scientism is just, you know, claiming that you're uh, adhering to scientific principles when all you're actually doing is acquiescing to the power and authority structure that you're nestled within. And it seems to be that that's why, you know, these things like your colleague just saying, I'm just following orders. And that, that such an extreme unthinkingness around every aspect of this could be carried out because the thing against which those decisions are being made is, is confirming and inducing and incentivizing them rather than, which is a point that I was trying to make to, you know, people that I was speaking with at the time, if we don't have grounded absolute principles against which to judge both our own actions and what's happening in the social or politi political sphere, then we're really lost. Like mm -hmm. then we're, you know, we're untethered to anything that allows us to make ethical decisions. And of course, and, and the response was the same that you got to your religious exemption things like, come on, like, mm -hmm. you know, whether those are the principles in the, yeah. in the, in the, founding documents of countries like freedom and liberty and these sorts of mm -hmm. things, or whether, again, they're even more tethered in, in the religious realms, the, the notion that they were somehow important to society was completely discarded in the face of the hysteria, the panic, and the authority that was coming down and, and inducing people to, to act certain ways, and obviously giving them the, the cover fire to do so. And so what what is your take on how science has become, or, or sci scientism has become this secular religion and the artifice of, of the state that's kind of uh, enforcing it. Yeah. So like I had mentioned when I was in college, I was, I, I, I considered myself an atheist at the time. You know, I was a consumer of atheist materials that were Put like out Sam by the Harris, four Richard horsemen. Dawkins guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and like to be honest with you, out of all of them, I was the biggest fan of Christopher Hitchens, who has long since passed away, because I thought that he had the most. Um, he seemed to have the most humanity in him than anyone else. Like he seemed to be more philosophically, historically, and literally grounded in his dismissal of religion, mm -hmm. whereas Dawkins came at came at it usually from a strictly like scientific perspective Harris came at it with a like a moralizing perspective and I was never really a big fan of Dan Dennett's work out of the four horsemen that I'm so like I gravitated towards Hitchens he just like and I found him entertaining to be honest right, he was an entertaining right. figure he mm -hmm. he knew how to write he knew how to speak he drank good whiskey <laughs> <laughs> in almost every conversation he had so like I've I've had my time with atheism and I, at the time I thought that you could look towards scientism for the answers that, uh, that were necessary once you remove religion from your life. But fundamentally it wasn't until I encountered, um, Jordan Peterson's work when I was really was able to like, I, I was receptive to a more practical, um, view of religion and of mm -hmm. spirituality and of myth of mythos and the stories that we tell each other. And I think that people that I've spoken to in my workplace, in the institutions that I've been in, they dismiss religion on purely scientific grounds, which I now know is a mistake. Like you cannot, it would be like, you, you, you know, the joke, like people say, like, you know, you shouldn't jump off this or you shouldn't do something obviously harmful or you should do something obviously helpful. But the joke is that there's no randomized control trial to justify doing that or not doing that. It's kind of the same thing. Like, how are you Sounds going like to Sounds like a dismiss... doctor joke, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So like, don't jump off a bridge. Oh, but the, has there been a randomized control trial to prove that right, jumping right, off a bridge right. is harmful? Like it's, you cannot take that uh, criteria of assessment to something that doesn't address a scientific question. Like scientific questions are not concerned about spirituality scientific questions are not concerned about morality and i know that harris tried to make a case for this in particularly in the moral landscape but i don't believe that we can use science to guide how we act and live and this was perfectly illustrated to me in the covid era and you know one of the things that was very uh moving for me when I was facing termination, my boss, like my supervisor, <clears throat> 
she understood my perspective. She empathized with my perspective. And I could tell that there was pain in her face when she had to do the things that she did to me to get me out of work. And credit to my department, they tried to make accommodation so that I could continue as an employee. You know, maybe I can work remotely. Lots of people were working remotely at the time. I don't have to come in contact with the institution. They did, I think they did what they thought they could do, what they thought was their best. And I could see the pain in their face when they had to essentially terminate me. And not just the pain in their face one time when I spoke to them. Every time I had a conversation with this person, whether it was on the phone, I could hear it in her voice, or when it was in person, I could see it on their face. Like they knew what they were doing was wrong, but they felt like they had no choice but to do it because some authority and they and it's it's almost like they were confused because they didn't know when they gave this authority so much power over their lives. Mm. And it wasn't until that moment that they had realized the weight of their their subjugation to this authority because it's never been tested, just like my resolve was never tested until that time in my life. It, it's almost like the people who wanted to be in this position of, you know, it, it, we talk about in hospital, you have doctors and you have administrators and some people gravitate towards the administrative element of the hospital, you know, logistics. And, the, and these are doctors that gravitate towards it. And they want these positions where they run departments and they have say in policy and all these things. But I, I, I don't think... I don't think a lot of these people knew just how much they were being leveraged and how much their sense of right and wrong was being uh, like bastardized, <laughs> essentially, and to make them do things that they would like. If it, if they were left to their devices, I would not have been out of a job. I I, I know this in my heart. I know right. that the people who were my bosses and both hospitals, they would not have fired me because they know what I've been through. They know what I did for that hospital in 2020 and in 2021. There's no way they would have fired me in 2021 at the end of that year. It's only the cold, brutal administrative authority that made that action go into sequence, as it were, and use them to do it. And I mean, I see this everywhere. Like people have this belief that science gives them the answer to everything without ever really and, and i don't even know if it's just scientism or if it's just ignorance because like science answers a lot of questions you know like if you have a scientific eye for things you could get to the bottom of a lot based on the experimentation that has already been done but most people don't even scratch the surface and i don't know like it what's like where does scientism end and ignorance begin or distraction i find a lot of people are distracted their attention is you know they're working long hours their bosses have them and i'm, I'm speaking in the hospital their bosses have them doing so many things that they don't have the time to dig into the details like i remember one of my colleagues in britain he worked i think at the time he was in london or one of its boroughs or something he said how do you have the time to read all this literature because i kept coming to him with like oh look at this information i found look at this it was all of covid related and he's like, how do you have the time to read all this? I'm like, I don't know. This is a, it's a pretty important topic. It's, it's kind of permeated everyone's life and my job is at risk. So that's why I'm reading about it. Um, but I think most people just don't have the time. So I don't know if scientism per se was the problem here or, yeah, or if it was just ignorance and what, where one starts and the other begins. I don't know. What do you think about that? Like, I, it'd be great to get an outside perspective on it. Yeah, well, they're they're definitely related, but the, what comes to my mind when you're saying that is, I, I think, and it's a problem that plagues many different elements of our individual selves and the society of which we're a part of these days, which is that notion that, like, the the kind of detached, untethered notion, right? Like, if you're not, you consciousness requires something to ground it. Right. And I, I I believe this has been the religious enterprise broadly construed for like all of human history. It's like what best orients consciousness such that we can determine our action and those actions lead to the greatest probability of good outcomes. Mm. What, is, what are those things? And I think that the religious enterprise, whatever faith it may be, 
if you really, you know, look past the surface level of things, you see that they 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 have teased out of that enterprise things like the divine nature of each individual and their 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 responsibility and their right to decide for themselves what's best for them which may be construed as some you know some kind of uh individual freedom you know individual agency the power of truth truthful speech action in a, in accord with those principles which you could say is kind of truth in action honesty integrity with his, which is not just you know being honest and forthright in your interactions but also being integrated with those most consequential principles you know what's mm. what's most consequential is is we could also say is most real which is why like you know the the religious stuff is real in the most real sense but that's mm -hmm. one of the things that people that have a materialist you know reductionist secular worldview have an issue with, but I think that's the very thing that causes them to detach and become untethered with that necessary integration with all aspects of being the physical, the metaphysical, the emotional, you know, all those things, which, you know, you as a, as a healthcare provider, obviously are very much concerned with because you're looking to see like what allows an individual to be as not only strong, healthy, vital, and happy as possible, but also filled with meaning and be able to pursue what is most fulfilling to them. Hmm. So I think, you know, a big issue with our, our times is that many people have, have become detached like that. And you become detached from that primary tether. I think that also means then you become to detach from one another because you're not your true selves with one another. You become detached, you know, from the world, broadly construed culture, natural world, whatever it is. And you could say that's uh, represented in our relation to food, let's say, right? Like people just, you know, go to the grocery store and pull all this refined shit off the shelves and eat it. And they have no sense of where it comes from, how it was made, the impacts on their bodies. And then maybe even the worst one is you become detached from yourself. And I think that's partially responsible for all these diseases of despair and substance abuse and emotional turbulence and, you know, all the, all of that. Yeah. And so it's a really bad soup. And I think it comes from either a lack of recognition for the, the, the role of those absolute principles or actively ignoring them because you've been misled into thinking that, you know, they're a superstition of the past or they hold no value or, you know, all of human history that's been capitulating those questions and trying their, their darndest to, to, gain more insight and wisdom around them hmm. was just like, you know, a silly enterprise that happened before science came on the scene, you know, because yeah. as you, as you said, science is about learning about the natural world and the interactions that happen within it. Right. But it, it, it doesn't, I think, well, I think it's evident that it, it, it doesn't tell you how you can't extract an off from it is as, as the saying goes. And I don't think it's the proper conceptual it, it can never deliver the proper conceptual framework for you to pursue an integrated life that is maximally fulfilling and that allows mm -hmm. you to discern and act out truth in all the places where you need to do so and so that in conjunction with the incentives that we re referred to before and the influence of fiat and all that kind of stuff is creating all these instances where absolute hysterical asinine ignorant incompetent behavior is allowed to flourish to, you know, really tragic effect, whether it's COVID or many other things we could point out in society today, because those things are so discombobulated. And, you know, my last point on this is you said, you know, when people were um, being confronted with uh, these mandates and what it meant for their, their career and their income. And you, I think you use the word resolve and they were trying to figure out like, you know, where do I access the resolve to stand down this, what I deem to be tyranny effectively. And, and I'm talking about, you know, like obviously some people, depending on the situation, they, you know, they made certain decisions, but just that question alone, where do I get the resolve, I think has caused um, a resurgence in spiritual inquiry, let's say, yeah. you know, because when you, when you peel back the layers of the onion enough, it's like, that's where resolve comes from, right? Yeah. Because if yeah. resolve is just you and your physical meat sack, it's like, it just, it doesn't have the same, 
you, you can't find it there and you, you mm -hmm. have to find it someplace deeper. And then when you, when you go down and you say, you say, Oh, I found resolve. I found the truth. That's going to be most sustaining to me. That's going to allow me to confront the most uh, difficult challenges that I might confront. And it's, a, it's almost like if people don't like the moniker of religious, maybe they should just think that whatever you find, like whatever through that journey that you find that allows you to to most sustain yourself in the most challenging circumstances that is what we call religious or or religion mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. just so just so happens that you're not the first one to confront those things <laughs> and the wisdom of that journey has yeah. been codified and communicated in many different ways exactly. throughout many different you know cultures exactly. and traditions and we shouldn't just cast it aside because you know now our technological advancement has become so spectacular that we're mm -hmm. all consumed with the ways in which we can manipulate matter yeah but i do think you know i think that's the problem of our times and that question of resolve which which the covid era uh forced many people to confront is now resulting in i think a a resurgence in in religious or spiritual idea you know inquiry and yeah that's that's really fascinating and i've seen it like yeah. it, it's very evident now you i mean you must have seen it as well right the more people are kind of revisiting those places be, you know and saying like maybe i maybe i was too quick to judge or maybe the culture didn't steer me in the right direction in assessing yeah. these things because they seem way more important than i had previously thought well it just depends on like uh where i go you know like there's certain elements of uh this uh industry like you go to certain parts of the world and this industry has people more and more in uh, there's like a gradient of inculcation in this industry so depending on where you go you'll get different answers but i do but i do know that i've seen people become much more skeptical of things that they would otherwise have not been skeptical of if COVID had not happened and to be honest with you i think that that's like the silver lining here is that whatever constellation of incentives if you want to think it's a constellation of incentives or whatever conspiracy if you want to think it's an intentional conspiracy whatever force behind this movement towards tyranny whatever it is that's been doing it i think they've and i've tweeted this before like i haven't really written extensively on it i think they've overextended themselves and they've exposed something that they shouldn't have exposed like they've kind of pulled the curtain back Mm -hmm. and shown people that there's just some unhealthy slob in the back that wants all your output and money that's trying to like figure out ways to extract it from you and to you know like i'm not saying that's literally the case but you understand the picture i'm painting yeah and like i, I think that's the silver lining is like there's been they did it so with such vigor and with such intensity that it's forced people to start looking at things more critically and myself included. Like I never, I was always just skeptical of the thing that I was engaged in because that's all I knew. Like I, I don't have a broad experience in life when it comes to different professions or different uh, careers. Like I've had a handful of jobs before I was a doctor and then I was a doctor and that's pretty much all I've been doing for quite some time. And um, so I just thought the problem was within our, and I didn't realize how widespread it was. But now that, you know, I'm talking to lots of people because of the internet, because of this profile I have, and I'm learning that these things are everywhere and people are starting to open up. And I think that's, I think that's the, that gives me hope is that they went so far that they exposed themselves, whoever they are, whatever it is, and force people to become more conscious in their day-to-day -day decisions. And you're right. I think it's caused a spiritual awakening. Like I talk to people now in spiritual terms. Like I don't, like I have no problem in the past. I wouldn't have like, you know, incurred the word God or Allah, like where I'm from, everyone is Islamic. Uh, but I do that like everywhere. And people like, at first they look at me strange and they're like, you know what? That's a nice touch. <laughs> People are like more well, recipient. They're, uh, they're more receptive to it now. Like in the past, I remember one time I, uh, I I was talking to a colleague of mine. We were just texting and we were trying to make some plans or whatever, talking about the future. And I ended it with saying, you know, like I just said, inshallah, which means, you know, God willing. And her response was, uh, that's a nice touch. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> 
that's been my observation too, man. Like before, you know, even a few years back, you bring up God or God comes up and it's kind of like ick. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, like, but now pe pe people allude to a particular faith, God, you know, something of that nature. And it's like, oh, that's nice. That's yeah. Really nice. It's like, who else is going <laughs> to, like, no one else is going to make that come to fruition for you other than you and yeah. how strongly you adhere to the thing you believe in. And honestly, like you were talking and I kind of had this realization because, you know, I don't think science answers questions of morality. And when I think you try to force science to answer questions of morality, like let's say Sam Harris did in his book, The Moral Landscape, you open the door for people to start overvaluing science in their life. Because if science can answer the questions of morality, which is fundamentally the question of how you should engage with other human beings, like what right. else is morality? Mm -hmm. If you start to say that, oh, you can make a case for why experimentalism uh, can answer that question and only you you could rely on this without uh, calling to any other value hierarchy, um, you start to open the door because then it can answer everything. Like that's, I think that's like the final thing that it answers. If it does answer that, I don't think it does, but that's the final thing that it answers. So when you say that, okay, science can be used to make a case for morality, then like science can be used to make a case for anything. And it can, mm -hmm. like, it's not even that you're deriving an ought from an is because in scientific experimentation, you have a null hypothesis and you have an alternate hypothesis, and you're testing your hypothesis. And usually what you're doing at the end of an experiment is you're saying what something is not. So like in scientific experimentation, you're narrowing the range of things that could be by excluding things that are not. So it's not even saying you're deriving an ought from an is, you're deriving an ought from a not is, which is even harder to derive than, I'm guessing, than deriving an ought from an is. Yeah. So it, it like the leap is even greater than that... Uh, than that phrase would suggest. So once you do that, like you start, and I know people that that they, they think this, they believe this, you know, they think that you can derive a functioning society, moral values, ethics, and law just from, from science. And like, that's never been a more alien idea to me now right? than it has in the past. Like, I, I, there's no way you could do that. I, I think I totally agree. And I, I think a lot of those people also, um, are not appreciative of the degree to which that de facto cultural perspective that we alluded to before that you kind of just get by osmosis is so much influenced by broadly construed the religious enterprise that, you know, at least has been more uh, elevated in the past. You know, as a simple example, which I always bring up, it's it's way oversimplified, but I think it makes a point. It's like, if you grew up in a small tribe in the Amazon, do you think you would hold the same views you have now, be it regarding ideology, liberalism, political views, preferences for pineapple pizza, all that kind of shit? No, no, because you would have grown up in an entirely different meaning landscape and mm -hmm. you would have adopted all of that, mostly subconsciously. And that's what people need, you know, I think would behoove people to realize today is, you know, before you go out and wag your finger at the world, and certainly before you go and presume to force people to do a given thing, you have to realize that most of your perspective is subconscious. You're not aware of it. And so maybe you should spend more time becoming more aware of it, where it comes from, and whether or not is the perspective that you want to have that you think is moral, ethical, righteous, what have you, before you go out and presume to imp impose it on the world. And, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, kind of the, what. Well, be more comfortable with using religious language lately. And, that, and again, it's just, for me, it's this shift of before you would say, well, that's the spirit of evil. And you'd be like, ah, I'm not really, that's not how I see things. You know, it's a little bit too simplistic or whatever, but like, what do you, if you just reverse it and say, that's actually just trying to describe when circumstances emerge, not that like, you know, the, the devil has taken control of someone's avatar or something like that. Like, you were asking about uh, ignorance and we were talking about ignorance and scientism and all that kind of stuff before. And it's like, what do you call it when people aren't aware of their perspective and they allow themselves to uh, impose their ignorance on others and they allow an ideology to, you know, take hold of them without 
any pushback or without any scrutiny. And they respond blindly to their incentives, Mm. regardless of what they are. And all those things, might you say that that is kind of like the, the, those are the result of a particular spirit. Like, should we describe that as them allowing themselves to be kind of uh, inhabited by a particular spirit? Conversely, when you do the opposite of all those things, when you are more grounded in in truth, and when you scrutinize your perspective like that, and when you don't presume superiority over others and all those things, might you characterize that as being as acting in accord with the spirit of of good, for example? Yeah. It doesn't seem that irrational. It doesn't seem yeah. that unreasonable or foreign or anything like that. And you know, I think both of us would probably admit that we're still wrestling with these issues and trying to figure out, you know how best to be oriented by them, but it's definitely, um, it's been very fruitful in my own journey and I've, it's been really, uh, interesting and, and amazing. And I think, uh, good broadly speaking to see that so many other people are grappling with, with things like this as well, because, you know, prior to all the COVID stuff, one of my gripes, since I was like 19 years old, is like, how come nobody thinks, right? How come, you know, I I know you've you've written about the the pharmaceutical industry and then you know the fines and the the nefarious activity that they've engaged in. And again, the last three years has been another huge example of that. How come like that doesn't affect anyone when you see them pay a three billion dollar fine or when you see fraud and all this kind of stuff? How can you just yeah. turn the next the next week and go trust what they say or do or offer you after that? You know, and it seems like all of that is kind of changing now, and mm-hmm. people are more open to the responsibility that they need to take for their own perspective. And then the journey where that leads them is, is leading them to, you know, I think very interesting, fruitful, fulfilling, meaningful places. And so I, as you said, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful for uh, the, the change that's coming out of this era. Um, that's us on time, man. So I, you know, I could talk to you for hours. There's a bunch more stuff I wanted to hit, but I'll let you go for of now. Did, what my last question for you is just, you know, what's, What's the direction for you right now? What are your ambitions for the future? I mean, what are you trying to do, accomplish, get out there? The floor is yours. Yeah, so I've talked about this with a few of my colleagues as well, and I think there's a general consensus that modern medicine is so defunct that there is room for a parallel industry to emerge, and it is emerging. I mean, I'm not going to suggest that I'm a pioneer in this or anything that's been emerging for years, you know, whether it's direct primary care, people taking more educational roles. Um, But I think the internet is what the internet, and then I kind of like nest Bitcoin in the internet Mm -hmm. as a technology, the internet allows physicians who really care about helping people live healthier lives to accomplish that. So my goal, the next few years is to start transitioning away from this fiat job and into a something that's a little bit more valuable to people and i think that there's enough hunger at least that i've seen just writing you know i haven't i haven't put out any audio really no video nothing formally educational in any sense and there's already just been this rise in attention that I really didn't expect to happen in such a short period of time. And honestly, I don't even know if I was prepared because there's so many things that are happening in my life that I'm trying to like address. But yeah, uh, my goal is to transition away from the fiat world and into a world that uh, where I can help people understand their health. And that's what I'm trying to do with my writing. Um, I'm now kind of taking like a part-time job in the hospital so I can have more time to do that and accelerate that so that maybe one day, you know, I don't have to find myself geographically locked Mm -hmm. um, and still be able to provide for my family. And that's really all I want to do. Like, I don't, I don't come from a family of doctors or wealth. So like, I'm not used to a certain lifestyle that I alluded to from my classmates when I first went on this journey. So that stuff doesn't really I don't know, it doesn't really drive me. What does drive me is curiosity. And th- th- like, there's no better feeling than when someone like genuinely thanks you for having helped them feel better, be better and uh, live a healthier life. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do it online mostly because the way I see it, like whatever geographic location I can find in the US at the moment, 
it, like it's not permanent like i can't bet on it to raise the like to root my family in it because i don't know what's going to happen like things change all the time you could mm -hmm. find a state you know some people move to florida some people move to texas i don't know so i'm sure that's going to change as well like the landscape is so chaotic so that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to like move myself into the digital space and the decentralized space you know so to speak to allow people to tell me what's worked for them to get feedback from humans, to try to inform the decisions and the things that I write about from as many different sources as possible. And really that's just like, that's been a huge learning experience and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to first find and transition into that space. So that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, you know, I'm a, I often talk about um, how I think adoption is gonna play out is, is just, you know, the Bitcoin economy will continue to grow and it'll be predicated not just on the rails of Bitcoin, but the kind of the ethos, the principles that seem to be emerging through or from it. And uh, as, a, as a result of that, people are going to want to do business, interact with people that share those, those principles. And um, I think that's going to end up being so compelling to outsiders that, you know, a lot of people, as this really gets going, they're not going to care about monetary history or Austrian economics or any of that kind of stuff, but they're just going to look and say, I want to interact on that basis. I want that degree of, of trust, of com camaraderie, of alignment. I want that degree of, of scrutiny, proof of work, responsibility in whatever one's chosen discipline is. Like, I, I don't want that static rotten fiat perspective for any of the things that I engage in, especially my healthcare. Like I want sure. someone who's yeah. has, sharing the same perspective that I am. So basically, you know, the punchline is we need, we need everyone in this thing, you know, that have that bring their own expertise and experience, but recapitulate it through a lens that's more truthful, uh, more liberated, more integrated, you know, all the things that we've been discussing. And it certainly seems to be the case that that's the track you're on. So I have no doubt that, you know, should you continue that there's going to be a lot of people that would value your, your perspective, your input, your services, all that kind of stuff. So just keep doing what you're doing. In fact, do more of it. And uh, I suspect <laughs> good things will happen. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks for okay, the we'll, conversation. Yeah. I loved it. We'll, we'll have to do it sometime in the future. I'll, I'll hit you up in, uh, in six to 12 months or something. We'll do it again. All right, looking forward to it, man. Have a good all day. Right, Take care.